Uh, if you have a Bible, I'm going to turn just now to the passage in uh, Ephesians chapter 2, uh, where I'm going to read. It's the first 10 verses. The, the series that we have been looking at over this past little while is thinking how the grace of God continues to work in, in our hearts uh, and lives. And this is a very real way in, in which God is working in us. Ephesians chapter 2 and uh, the first 10 verses, your page numbering is the same as mine. It's 1173. And let's hear God's word. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. And may God add his blessing upon his word. Amen. Uh, as part of my announcements this morning, I've already been confessing uh, some of, of my sins and, and mistakes. I'm going to make another confession just at this point. I don't think regard this one as a, as a terribly high-level uh, confession, but my confession at this point is that I have not invested sufficient time in the training of our dog. And the consequence of that is that our dog exhibits the characteristics that you might expect of someone who has not invested a lot of time in training. But at the same time, I'm not particularly worried. Even when I'm out, and uh, I'm out walking the dog, and I come across somebody else who may be in those moments where they do take offense at something that my dog has done at that moment because I've got the perfect answer. It may not be true, but that's not going to stop me. But what I'm going to say uh, to the offended person in that moment is... And I'm going to look at my dog, and I'm going to say, I'm awfully sorry, but she's a wee rescue. <laughs> and I guarantee that that will completely change the dynamics of anything that's been happening up to that point. Because the immediate reaction when you hear little phrases like that, she's a wee rescue, is complete sympathy. And the person will then immediately go, ah... Oh, but she is lovely, isn't she? And feels all that pity and all that. And no matter what the dog has done beforehand, and no matter how, I might, how embarrassed I might have been, in those moments, everything has now changed. And even more than that is that I will have been elevated in that person's understanding because I have now become a rescuer. And it's great to be a rescuer. And... I mean, everyone loves rescue stories, whether we're thinking of firemen and they arrive at a house that's on fire and, uh, and maybe if they come out with a dog out of the house and, and there's all the cheering and there's all the celebration because we love rescue stories. And I believe that that rescue story or that desire to be part of rescuing is part of us because in many ways that reflects our own maker because the Lord himself, the one who's made us, the one who's made the world, the Lord himself is the great rescuer. And as we read our way through the, the Bible and we, we read that narrative is that that theme of, of rescue 
It is intrinsic to what the Bible is about because God has always been on a rescue mission. So rescuing resonates with the heart of God. Uh, rescuing then also, because we're made in God's image, uh, resonates in our own hearts and lives. And so the Bible is a story of rescuing from start to finish. And whether we recognize it or not, uh, I'm sure that most of us here will recognize this, is that we are people in need of rescue. There may be some uh, who may not understand that. Certainly in our, in our world, in the population of the world at large, people may rebel against that notion that we are people in need of rescuing. And there's nothing wrong with people, with myself, people might think. But I would hope that today within the church, we are understanding that we are people in need of rescuing because we have, are trapped in our sin and there's nothing that we can do about that ourselves. And so when we're thinking about how the grace of God works in our lives, when we're thinking that the grace of God really does something, this really gets to the core of what that message is, is that this message of, of God working, of God saving, of God rescuing is endemic to, to all of that. Um, Alana did, did read those couple of verses, uh, which are, are very, very important in all of that. I'm going, if you have Ephesians chapter 2 open in front of you, I'm going to read verse 5 where it says that God made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace that you have been saved. And then down in verse 8, again, it talks about being saved. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. And that aspect of being saved, some people there's something about that that we don't like, that just because there may be some past association that we may have or past connection or past experience with an, with an individual. And some people react against uh, this notion of, of being saved. But I'm going to try and unpack, in my thinking, what I believe the Bible actually teaches about this. And there are a couple of questions that immediately jump into my mind when I think what it means to be saved. And the first one is simply, what am I saved from? What am I saved from? And the answer to that is very clearly made obvious in the passage that we've read. I'm not going to read the verses, but if you look at verse 1, one of the things that we have been saved from is that we have been saved from death and sin. Verse 2, we have been saved from a selfish lifestyle. And more significantly in verse 3, we have been saved from the wrath of God because God cannot look on sin and that God's anger burns against sin. But in Christ, we have been saved from that. So in simple terms, when I'm thinking, what is a Christian being saved from? Those are the things that a Christian has been saved from. But normally, when a Christian talks about being saved, we're inclined to put that in the past. It's always a past event. It's something that happened a while ago. It's behind us. But actually, when the Bible talks about being saved, it says that we are actually, there's three aspects to that. It says that we have been saved in the past. But the Bible also describes this is that we are being saved and that it's not complete and that God is working in us now. He is saving us in the present. And also the Bible says is that it will not be finished and that we will be saved in future and it's something that is ahead. So I'm just going to try and maybe unpack just what that means because when we think about what it means to be saved in the past, there was a definite moment in history, when Jesus stepped into the world. And more specifically than when that is that Jesus died on the cross and that on the cross, Jesus paid the penalty for my sin and your sin, the sin of the world. 
and that Jesus, when he did that, he did that for you, and that when the wrath of God was poured out upon Jesus, he paid the price, he took that away, that punishment that should have been yours, Jesus took that for you. And the good news of the gospel is that you do not have to pay the penalty. You do not have to pay the price of your sin because there was a moment in history, in the past, when Jesus stepped into that for you and he took that for you. You may have to, in temporal terms, pay for your sin. You know, if you run a red light and the policeman catches you, you will have to pay a penalty. You may have to go to court. You have to pay the, the temporal consequences, as it were, of your sin. But Jesus does not punish you for that because in Jesus, the punishment has already been meted out to him and Jesus has done that for you. So Jesus does not punish you. And if you are a Christian today, you will know that because of an event roughly 2,000 years ago that the grace of God has flooded your soul because that is something that Jesus has done for you. And more than that, that also means because of what something that Jesus did in time for you, that you cannot lose your salvation because Jesus has paid in time, definite, Jesus paid that for you. So that's what the Bible is talking about when it says you have been saved. But the Bible also talks about being saved in the present because right now God is working in your life. When anyone becomes a Christian, God gives the Holy Spirit into your life. And it is the job of the Holy Spirit to work in you to make you more like his son, Jesus. And the, in the power of the Holy Spirit, he is giving you the power to say no to sin and to say yes to him. And that is what we have experienced if we are standing in Jesus Christ today. That's the reality. And that's what God is doing in our lives. So that for you, you... Even as you look back on your own life, you may be able to think of something that you thought would never change. There was some sin in your life and you began to wonder, I am never going to be able to break free from this. I'm, I'm stuck like a cat that's in that net and there's nothing that I can do about that. And I just seem to get more caught up and it gets worse and it gets worse. But actually, fast forward that so many years on, as you look back at your life, you can begin to see what God has been doing and how God has brought change and how God has brought that into your life. So you can see that God is saving you in the present by the work of his Holy Spirit. But then there's also this thought that the Bible says that you will be saved in the future. It's still coming in the future. You remember when God made the world, in those early chapters of Genesis, how it's described is that after God made something, how was it described? God said it was very good. Now what that means is there's no sickness as originally created, there was nothing wrong. There was no imperfection. It was as God wanted it to be. And that desire to experience life as it was meant to be experienced is a yearning that God has placed within our hearts, is that we yearn, we long to have that experience as life was meant to be, but we know that right now, sin taints everything. And that more often than not, instead of saying yes to God, I say yes to sin. But I want something better. I yearn for something better. I yearn for that perfection that God one day will make possible when God finally puts all things right, when there will be no more sickness, there will be no more pain, so that when we're thinking of heaven, there's no need of doctors, there's no need of policemen, there's, there's no need of physios, there's no need of any of these things because life will be perfect and perfectly enjoyed. So this is what the Bible is talking about when it's talking about you being saved, saved from Past, present, future. But that does 
make me ask a question. Because is this something that you know in your own experience? So in other words, have you been saved? This is what the Bible is asking. So as you, you look me in the eye, and I ask that question, is that your experience? Have you been saved by the Spirit of God? Has, has that en- encounter with Christ become so real that you know this is you? And I'm, and I'm not asking whether you're religious. I'm, I'm not asking whether you're spiritual or whether you feel you're as good as anybody else. Have you been rescued by Jesus Christ so that you know that God has stepped into your life? And you can say that, yes, I know this is true of me. So that's what we're saved from. The second question that jumps into my mind is who does the saving? I'm not even going to answer that this morning other than saying it's Jesus. And we know it is Jesus and only Jesus. And there is nobody else. And there is nothing else that can do this. It is Jesus. And it's Jesus that we need. But what I'm going to focus on just now is the purpose for which Jesus saves you. I want you to go back to Ephesians chapter 2 and I want you to look at verse 10 because you can see that God has a purpose for anything that he is doing. It says that we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. The important aspect of seeing God's working in your life is to know that your life has value. And there are things that God wants you to do and that only you can do. And you don't need to be thinking you're doing something explicitly Christian. It's not necessarily simply something that you need to work full time in Christian ministry or that you need to give yourself completely 100% Uh, to be working in and through the life of the church all the time. But actually, you can be doing, as we might say, normal stuff during the week and giving yourself to God. And you can be doing what God is wanting you to do. So being a teacher, working in an office, working in a shop, whatever it is that you are doing, You can be doing that to the glory of God and there is no higher calling than actually getting on and doing whatever it is that God has set in front of you to do. But it may be that God will call you in a certain direction and that God will ask you to do something that he is explicitly asking you to step out in faith and to follow him. And if God is speaking and if God is challenging you in a certain way, is that you need to say, yes, God, I am prepared to do that. I am prepared to go where you're asking me to go and to do what you're asking me to do. And this is how the grace of God works in our lives. And he changes us and he challenges us and he pushes us. I'm going to come towards the conclusion of what I'm saying at this point. And I'm going to say at the outset is that I believe that some people here have yet to discover what it will be that God is really asking of them to be and to do. Maybe because you're younger or maybe because there are changes that will come into your life. But what I know is this, is that whatever it is, where God is directing you and pushing you and encouraging you to go is that God at the same time will be preparing you for that. And he will be bringing experiences into your life which will make you ready for that point. So whatever change that is coming, you will be ready to do what God is asking you to do. Now those changes could be expressed in a multitude of ways. It may be that it's a new job. It could be a new home. It could, be, it could be that you're getting married. It could be that you're about to have a child or you're about to have a family and all those things are new, but you know that God is working in your life and he is bringing those things to bear in your life and he is getting you ready for that point and that you need to be listening to what God is saying so that you are ready when that time comes. And that may be for some of us that you don't finally fully know 
what God is asking you to do. But I think for the majority of us here, you already are where God wants you to be. You are already doing what God wants you to do. And you don't need to learn anything new in that sense because it's already in front of you. You know what it is. God has already made that plain to you and you are where God wants you to be. And the question then that you need to face up to is what is the current priority of God in your life? In other words, are you actually bringing God into the middle of your experience and that you are asking God, can I honor you where I actually am today because this is where you have placed me? In my own Bible reading this week, I was reading from Luke chapter 18. And there's an incident there where Jesus heals a blind man. And in verse 43 of that chapter, it says that immediately the blind man received his sight and he followed Jesus. The writer began to push that a little bit and to make comments. And he says, note how the blind man uses his sight. Not to make life easier for himself, but to follow Jesus. And then he began to push that a little bit more and to probe my heart and perhaps even your heart today. What would describe your attitude? Are you glad that God has saved you so that you know that you will get to heaven when you die? Or should the Lord come? Or are you glad that the Lord has saved you so that you can serve him and follow him today? As I've been suggesting, I think many of us here don't need to learn anything new. We don't need to go anywhere new. We don't need to have any new experiences because you are where God wants you to be. You know what God wants you to know. You have what God wants you to have. You just need to get on and honor Jesus where you happen to be. And with my very last little comment, you know, God doesn't need your money. But actually, you may know of somebody else who could need encouraged in that way. God doesn't need your help but you may know a neighbor who does need your help. God doesn't need your best efforts, but he can use those best efforts in the lives of other people that you already know. And that is grace working in our lives. And that is God working out through our lives into the lives of others. This amazing, wonderful rescue that God has has worked in our lives, enabled in our lives, but it flows out from us into the lives of those around us. And we give thanks to God for that. And we're just asking ourselves, God, what would you have me to do today? Let me just pause and we'll pray and then we'll move into our last song. Lord, help us to take time to consider how we might honor you. Lord, we thank you for that full and free and wonderful salvation in Jesus. You have washed us clean. We are forgiven. We are accepted. But Lord, you're also working in us. And so, Lord, we would leave our lives before you. And we confess when we have not honored you fully. Lord, challenge us, push us, prod us that we might be your people that we might serve the living God today. And Lord, we are thankful that you have rescued us in Jesus. And Lord, if there are 
are some, even in our building today, or listening online, who have not reached that point in their own experience that, Lord, you would so work in their hearts that they will not be able to forget and to put to one side this thought of what you have done in their lives and that they will need to take Jesus as their Savior and their rescuer today. Lord, become so real and so large in our thinking and in our minds that we will know Jesus. In whose name we pray. Amen.